Welcome to Power of the Tribe podcast. I'm your host, John Connors, and today I have a mental management system that's going to help your development in jiu-jitsu or in life and help your performance in, in all aspects. And I'm here, as always, with my co-host, Dan Robin. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Mental management system, you're saying, today. That's I got some great info. Um, I think you're going to really like it. So what happened is, you know, I go out and compete a lot. And last October, I went down, we competed in Orlando at the IBJJF pans, the gi pans. And know what I find, Dan? One of the cool things about challenging yourself and taking on things is I end up seeking out resources to help me because I'm nervous and I'm like, man, I get this anxiety. And somehow I came across this guy's book. His name is Lanny Basham. And his book was titled With Winning in Mind. And, he has, and I think Lanny sub, Basham, you're saying. Yeah. So Lanny's last name is like Bass, like the fish, B A S S, and ham as in the meat. Basham, I think he pronounces it, though. Got it. And uh, I, I don't know where I came across his stuff, but I read his book in October and uh, it was good. So I like sometimes to read this stuff before I compete, the day right. or two and com- before I'm competing. And before you, know. you even get started on yeah. it, I think it's worth mentioning again that. I think a lot of people see you as completely ice in your veins competitor. Uh huh. And it's worth pointing out to them that like you it's not just born that way. Like right, like you worked not on it. All. Like so the point yeah. is I don't anyone, even have ice pe- in other veins. people <laughs> other people can get there is what I'm saying. I, you know I, what I definitely mean? Like, think anybody can improve how they deal with their anxiety and their pre performance jitters and all that stuff. Definitely. Right. And yeah. as we've always said, learning to deal with anxiety and jitters is more than a jiu-jitsu strategy, right? It, I, I mean, totally agree, yeah. yeah. And just that idea, so when you take on a challenge, you, you're you forced to go out and find resources and develop yourself, and then no, no matter how the challenge works out, you're better than when you started, you know? So um, that's what I've been finding. That's a cool thing. So I read his book last October. I thought it was really good, but like a lot of things, it just went on the pile after I read it. <laughs> I took some notes, and it was interesting, and I kind of forgot about it. But then recently, I came across some of his YouTube videos, and then I heard his ideas in his own voice, and it just really resonated with me this time, and it made a difference, because I did just compete, Dan. So t- what's today? June, what, 11th? Yeah, June 11th. So June 5th, I just did a sub-only showcase match, EBI rules, 15-minute match at Enigma Invitational, I guess they call it, up in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I was the main event. So it was very stressful psychologically. Um, our friend Paul Prodhoski, he, he said to me after the match, he goes, yeah, that was probably the most psychologically stressful situation you could be in. You're doing a longer format. So instead of a five-minute match that I'm used to, I'm doing a 15-minute match. That's a lot longer. Yeah. A lot longer, three times longer. Um, submission only. Then there's these EBI overtime rules, which I've never competed with. And then I'm competing against the owner and the head of another academy. And uh, it's up in New Hampshire, sort of his home turf, and all his supporters were there cheering him on, obviously. So, um, And I'm the main event. And it's not like a tournament. In a tournament, then, there'd be like 12 mats. Yeah. And you're just out there with a bunch of other yahoos doing your thing. You're really not the center of attention. But when there's one mat and then you're the main event, that's a lot of attention, a lot of focus. Does that, you had to go last as the main event? Oh, yeah. That... Yeah. And it's a big build up. And you're sitting around for like three or four hours waiting for your, your moment in the spotlight. Right. Yeah. And again, that other owner is not there. He's there to win. He's not there oh, yeah. to he's yeah. not there to show uh your skills and how good your progress oh, and no. how good you've yeah. he's there. Yeah, he's prepared. He's yeah. a really good competitor. And he's ready to go. Yeah. And uh in his mind, yeah, he's and then I have a lot of respect for him. He's putting it on the line too. It's, yeah. it's stressful for him as well. One of the things I figured out though, Dana for this tournament, I was nervous, as I am for a lot of them. But what I realized after reading or listening to this guy, Lenny Basham, is guess what? You can still perform well even if you're nervous. Sometimes yeah. we get this idea where, like we have to be perfectly calm and everything has to be. To get rid of the nerves, yeah. Yeah, or, or your performance is not going to be perfect unless you're perfectly calm. And that's not the case. You can be really nervous but then just put that aside and just go out there and compete and have a good comp- 
good performance, you know? Right. And that's what I found for myself was, because I was nervous before that. And then I went out, I had a very good performance. I'm happy with my performance. So, uh, I, and I think if you're, if you're feeling nervous before you compete or perform and you feel like, oh shit, this is going to deteriorate my performance, it's going to make you even more nervous. It's going to be more of a distraction. But if you can get to that place where you're like, yeah, I'm feeling really nervous. My palms are sweaty, but so what? I'm still going to perform at my best anyways. And that kind of like takes a little bit of edge off the whole anxiety situation. Right. And doing it a few times makes you realize like, I'm probably just going to make it through this, right? Like, right. I can't think of a, I, uh, here's a weird parallel, but I remember when I was pretty young, like in my 20s, I had to teach these some of these classes. And one of them had like 280 kids in it. Like that's a pretty big. College undergrads? Yeah. But I, but I was like 23, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, so it's sort of they're almost peers to you, yeah. you know what I mean? You don't really feel, you know, so now I think I wouldn't really feel pressure from 20, from college kids. But yeah. like back then it was like, oh, they're all going to be staring. I mean, it's a big auditorium. You're on a stage and you have a microphone. It's a big and, deal. And the first time you have nerves, you're sort of like, what are these nerves going to keep going? And am I going to like. You know, something right. disastrous, I'm going to like start stammering or faint or, you know, something <laughs> embarrassing, pee my pants or, you know what I mean? Like just yeah. something, something awful going to happen and like yeah. some some sort of humiliation. Mm. I don't even know exactly what, but you're like, is this just going to be humiliating or me like frozen and I can't talk or whatever? And then you get through it fine. And then the act of getting through it fine, the nerves hit again next time. Either the nerves get less, but if the nerves do hit again, you're like, all right, like I felt these nerves before and i i'm just gonna make it through you know what i mean like yeah. or it might take a few times or it might vary a little but you right. get the gist of it where you're like you've now competed and you felt the nerves hit and you've still competed well if they hit you again you'll probably feel like yeah all right like i'm not gonna like faint or like right. free, freeze solid or whatever and, else. and that understanding interrupts any kind of feedback loop that might be there from the nerves if you are afraid of, of being right. nervous yeah right but I like that. But the main point is that just the fact that people perform fine when they're nervous, right? Yeah. So that's what what Lanny Basham brought up. He said, if you think about it, most world records are occur under a lot of stress. You know, at the Olympics, at the World Championships, that's where somebody does something that they've never done before. You know, if you're just at home practicing, you probably aren't going to break a world record. You almost need the pressure of a big situation to raise your excitement of your body just enough that you can have like an outside outsized performance you know so uh, that's another good way to look at the pressure is that it can just as likely improve your performance yeah you could even yeah you could even feel like it's good that your nerves are yeah. there right yeah like a total calmness might take an edge off your performance might yeah so um oh so i i won my match Right. Great Congratulations. Thank you. And we've been gone for a while. I also competed in the no-gi pans at ultra heavyweight, and I only was, ended up being only one competitor in my division, but he's like the man. He's the number one guy in my division as a black belt. And um, I mean in the age bracket, not the weight. Yeah. And he's the number one in the ultra heavyweight too. So I eked out what, this, the narrowest of victories against yeah. that guy so um, he was very hard to deal with i'm guessing he's yeah he was very tough very explosive very good competitor he wins all the time and i just managed to like use my wily jujitsu to survive and just squeak out of the guy does someone like that know who you are at this point like he does you, you know can, who i am now yeah right. yeah and um like even prior to them like they're starting to know that like they're like yeah. i know who this guy is because yeah. when you first came on the scene you were an unknown quantity for right them, right, right. So yeah. that's changed. They probably, first of all, they probably have film of you now. Definitely video. Yeah. Yeah, video. And then, yeah. So they're pre and they're prepared. Yeah, he's he, prepared. Yeah. yeah. He comes to win. And uh, he's a great competitor and he's fast, explosive, good jujitsu. He's tough. Yeah. Um, and, and in that case, I kind of lucked out, Dan. I showed up and as I walked into the, uh, the competition hall, they came running up. They go, it's your turn to compete. Get out there. So I had like no time to warm up, but no time to have any nerves. So I just, oh, all right. Took off my sweats and just walked down there and then walked out in the mat and competed. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's better. In, in, in a lot of ways, it's way better. Yeah. Because all that prelude is just so ponderous, you know? It's like you just... The, the, it's not a lot of fun, you know? Right. Well, like with a lot of things that make you nervous, it's that period, which is the worst, right? It's not yeah. even the competing or, or the competing performing or whatever yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. It's always that lead up. One thing I always tell myself, too, is if it's like, you know, you're going to do something stressful at noon, it's like, and it's say it's 10 o'clock, I'll feel like, well, I'm already most of the way through this because the real unpleasantness started when I woke up. You know oh, what I mean? Right. Like, you see what I mean? It's yeah. like the the unpleasantness of the day was from 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and I'm already at 11 or whatever it is. Like, oh, yeah. I've made been making my way through this. Like, you can't discount that part of the part of what you're going through is that lead up right yeah so that's what you're saying in that case you you bypass the lead up you get to just yeah. get right on the map yeah but for this last competition dan i just i was irritable the last two days before i competed like everything started to annoy me yeah. do, you, do you ever have that experience i i had it with uh what kenny florian would fight in the ufc okay he was a very you know kenny he was yeah. a very very uh friendly and genial kind oh, of yeah, guy definitely and leading up to fights he'd just become mean like he would just oh, yeah. like he would just be mean to everybody yeah he would agree with this you know, i'm not like yeah you know he would say, like he would get he he would welcome it too he'd just be like he'd start to dislike his comp the guy he was going mm -hmm. against he'd start to you know snap at people in the gym especially mm -hmm. then weight cuts would come into play oh, and right. like and uh so i've experienced in that way like a lead up to an event and just someone getting like irritable and yeah and getting it's what do you think it you think it's just for you is mostly getting in the mind like an aggressive mindset or a competitive mindset um like why do you I, think you got irritable i think part of it is i'm frustrated with the anxiety that i'm experiencing so it's making me irritable and i think it's harder it's probably puts a cognitive load on your brain where you're where you're having anxiety and you're, and you're running scenarios and then you're trying to think and operate in real life. You know what I mean? It's probably a significant distraction. So that's irritating. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where if you're trying to do something and some car alarm's going off in your head, that's it just starts to get you annoyed, right? right. Irritable. Yeah. Well, do you have trouble sleeping? Um, it, Just a little bit. Not much. I'm getting much better at all that stuff. Yeah. But I tell you when... So this past weekend, when I so I ended up winning in overtime, I escaped faster than my opponent did, and at the moment that I won, Dan, it's such a good feeling. It's so funny, like that one instant dwarfed the pain and discomfort of the irritability and, and of the couple of days leading up to it. Totally, way more than compensated for it. So yeah. it, it's really strange, you know. Like when you're leading up to compete and it's like three or four hours, it feels like weeks. You're waiting there for weeks. It's just like, when is this going to happen? Yeah. And uh, it's never ending kind of dull torture, you know. And, but then when you win it in one split, not even a full second, less than a second, you feel such joy and happiness that it, it more than compensates for everything that went before it. Really interesting. There's a really good half second there. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, yes. Well, I'll tell you – the. It does feel good to win, and how I feel now, I don't know it's cause, if it's because I'm getting older, but when I have that moment of like, wow, I won, that's awesome, I think if I didn't take on this challenge, I would have deprived myself of this moment in my life. You know what I mean? If for some reason I didn't take, yeah. try to do the event or I, di I didn't uh, take on the challenge, then I, I couldn't have that moment of victory. I could have deprived myself of it you know i could have lived another life where i didn't have that experience and that's just that's the, that would have sucked right that would be terrible right yeah i mean you could have not done any of these yeah uh, you could have just not competed at all yeah right i mean after like at least this last round yeah oh i could have yeah, yeah well i um i started the first time i competed what since i took a huge layoff i took like 18 years off was September of 2018, yeah. So that all of that could have not happened. I yeah. could have just continued not competing. And um, my life would have been way less interesting and way less satisfying, yeah. Um, but at any rate, so I stumbled back onto this guy, Lanny Basham, somehow. So I had about 10 weeks to prepare for this most recent match. 
So in the last couple of weeks, I came across his YouTube videos. He must have come up with my feed somehow. I started listening to him. I think he's from Texas. So he's got that like old fashioned, just like um, grounded, emotionally stable person. He's very practical and makes sense about everything. And this is something that he came up with himself. So what happened was then he was competing in the Olympics in marksmanship, sort of shooting. Um, I guess they shoot from lying on the, on the knees and standing or something. And he got a silver medal, but he was dissatisfied because his performance, I guess, in practice was way better. And he's like, what the hell? I should have got a gold medal. And uh, so he, he started to interview other champions to find out if they could help him figure out what he was doing wrong. And he came to the conclusion that he was over trying, which I think is a really interesting concept. Uh, so in other words, whatever activity you're doing, whether it's podcasting or jujitsu or whatever the hell it is, there's an optimal amount, optimal amount of trying that you should be doing. So if you try 1% less than optimal, your performance will be less than optimal. If you try 1% more than optimal, you're also, your performance will be less than optimal. Uh, I hadn't really thought of that before. What do you think? Well, my friend, that's obviously we've been over trying on this podcast. <laughs> well, that's the, I think there's been the, days to me too we've been under trying, no, but yeah. <laughs> dial it back a little. <laughs> yeah, no, I hadn't thought of it that way either. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. Because people, again, they don't frame it that way usually, right? They say, I give 110%, and I give, 100, right. I give 150%, and it seems like the more you dial it up, the better. But people don't think optimal. That, that's our know? culture is... Yeah is we value hard work, which is a lot of good comes from that. You know, the people who over try, they generally have a pretty good life. Things work out for them. They get people hire you. If you're going to be an over trier, you'll probably get hired, but you may not have optimal performance. Right. And yeah. also optimal performance probably involves trying very hard. <laughs> you know, it's not oh, like, right, right. it's not like the optimal amount is late, like a, <laughs> between lazy and a little effort, right? Like optimal is probably like a lot between of effort. Complete sloth <laughs> and laziness. Yeah, yeah. somewhere you're not calibrating in there. Yeah, exactly. So it's probably a lot of effort too. But then, you know, but but the point here is you could go past it. You can go past it. And I noticed, as far as jujitsu is concerned, when students come in, most of them are over trying, and that comes out in over gripping. So they grab you too hard. Their body gets really stiff, and. Um, so they not only do you waste energy when you're stiff like that, Dan, it's easier for your opponent to deal with you. It's easier to sweep somebody who's, who's stiff because they're, they're like a plastic toy soldier and you just grab the wrist and you control the whole body because they're, they're so rigid and, and you get tired because you're wasting energy. Yeah. Yeah. Stand up is like that with, I, even for me, mm. I'll get, I know I'm getting tired when, for me, it's when someone's swinging hard at me. And mm -hmm. it gets, then I get tense. I'm like, wow, that could, they could knock me out. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm, then I'm more tired because you're like, yeah, you know, you're, you sort of can't help like sort of tensing up. Yeah. And round after round that it's it holes on you. Yeah. And you're not, you're probably not as quick and yeah. you're not as elusive as you would be otherwise. Yeah, you're probably getting hit more. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, the other place I, I noticed it in myself is sometimes if you're escaping Dan, <clears throat> excuse me say the mount position or your defending guard somehow when you over trying can, can um, end up where you're creating too much space. You know, so if I'm trying to escape the mount, I want to create just enough space maybe to get my shin between me and my opponent. And then once I get that in, now I'm trying to hold on to them and I'm trying to sweep them. I'm trying to get into my offense when I'm over trying, I'm like trying to shove them across the room to get like completely free of me. So I waste all this energy and then they can kind of run around me and, and get to side control or something, you know. I don't know if that's a right. if that's a clear explanation for our jujitsu students, but and then of course the over gripping and the over exerting um, can just exhaust you, and it gets you in a mindset when you're over trying of you start to hesitate. You're afraid to make a mistake, you know, when you're over trying, and if you hesitate, you're missing opportunities where you could have you could score or get some progress or some offense so i think it's a real thing and then when somebody's learning a technique in the gym dan if they're over trying i find that their body 
has that extra tension and they can't move the way they naturally want to move. And it's just harder to do the technique than it, than it would be otherwise. And, and here's what I think. If you're used to over trying, if you just say, well, I'm going to try a little bit less, that's probably not the best uh, method to calibrate. So you should probably actively try to under try a little bit and then you can over try again. You see, you can start calibrating and start dialing and comfortable. find like the, the optimal amount of trying. But if, if you never deliberately under try, it'll probably take you much longer to get to that point of optimal trying. So um, at any rate, Lenny Basham has these stories about how he cured his over trying. And sh this shooting sport is so precise, Dan, like the practice and the competition setups are exactly the same. So you're certain distance, certain targets, certain weapons. So he was losing 10% from practice to competition. So you know you have some problem, like I'm losing 10%. And it, it's very precise. He, they have to squeeze the trigger in between heartbeats. Like if you're, if you're squeezing when your heart beats, it's, like a, it's enough it to throw you off. Yeah. yeah, and you need to have almost all bullseyes. Like the, you, you can only miss a few times within like dozens of shots. I They're guess, not like yeah. sending bullets all over there. <laughs> so, yeah. he, so he came up with some ideas. So the first idea, which, which I thought made a lot of sense was, he said, well, I'm going to make my practice like competition. Makes sense, right? I'll bring all the intensity of competition into my practice so everything will even itself out. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Apparently, it didn't, it didn't work. work. Yeah. <laughs> so then he thought, well... well what happened? Was he 10% worse in his practices or it just didn't work? Then he went to the real competition and he still lost the 10%. I think that's what it was. Yeah. That just didn't help him. It didn't help. And then he tried to... Um, oh, he said, well, I'll just not care. So I'll go to competition. I won't even care. And then, and then he got careless, and then that's not good either. And it's interesting just because these are things we've talked about with jujitsu too, right. right? Like different strategies people use. I do think what I do with my new students who are, haven't competed yet is I try to uh, role play with them. So it's like you're going to stand at the edge of the mat here. You're going to stand over here. The referee is going to come like this just so they know what to expect. You know what I mean? We're, we're not necessarily bringing – competition intensity to the practice but we're bringing the trappings and the environment a little bit just so that when they get to that environment it'll feel familiar and it'll be less stressful does that make sense mm -hmm. like if you don't even know where to stand like i compete where do i go that's okay. not good that's stressful um so then he tried to not care that didn't work and then he said well i'm going to try to just dial it back and care less at the competition and he said that it didn't, he didn't even know what the hell that meant. He's like, yeah. I couldn't even find the dial. So his solution was, and you won't be surprised when you hear this, is he just focused on his performance. In other words, his process. And so typically he would shoot, and if he would, if if you get the bullseye, you score 10 points. If you're just outside of it, you get a nine. So he would like keep in his head the nines. So after like several you know, maybe a dozen rounds of shooting, he'd be like, oh, I'm down two right now. And it was always like, now I'm down three. And then when the end of his round was over, he would know what his score was. Yeah, how'd you shoot? Pretty good. I, I was down four or whatever the hell it is. This time, he didn't keep any score in his head. He just focused on how he held his weapon, all the stuff he was supposed to do. And then when the competition was over, his friend said, how did you do? And he goes, yeah, I have no idea. And it turns out that he did so well. Not only did he win, he set a record that lasted 14 years. So he scored, he shot yeah. better than he ever had yeah. in his entire life. Um, very interesting, right? Yeah. It's amazing how much it parallels literally the same thought process for jujitsu for such mm. an entirely different activity. You know what I right. mean? Like it's that you'd think there's no comparison at all. Right. But we've said that we know examples. I've done it myself where you're like, if struggling in jujitsu, being like, I'm going to try harder to do mm. well, like then I'm not going to care. I'm going to oh, go right. for, I'm going to go for the social aspect, right. or I'm going to go, you know, mm. I'm going to relax and not worry about. I'm going to tap more frequently, like, and then after years of this, like you've zeroed in on focus on the on the pro the process and yeah. what you're supposed to do and the and the technique, yeah, and him in like shooting, which is something I've never given two thoughts to, sort of circle the 
sort of did the same thing. Yeah. Circled and ended up in the same spot. Now, this guy, Lenny Basham, is a coach. He coaches a lot of different athletes and a lot of golfers, apparently, because, you know, he describes sports are um, pro, I think he calls it proactive and reactive. So, like, shooting and golf is very proactive. Like, you hit the ball when you decide to go hit the ball. And, like, the environment doesn't react to you. You don't have to react so much right. to the environment. Jiu-jitsu is a little bit different. You know, I you step on the mat and the guy's trying to strangle you. You're trying to strangle him. It's a little you bit know different. What's happen. Yeah, there's less there's less Shooting's control. At shooting, you know exactly what's going to happen. Like yeah. there's no X factor there at all. There's very few variables, and um, but your performance has to be uh, nearly perfect in order to really win. So so it's it's different. But in this last competition, I did this this. Uh, showcase match super fight whatever you want to call it i did try to focus on i just want to have good jujitsu performance i just want to go out there and do my good jujitsu and not think about winning or 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 anything else just just do good jujitsu when you're out there just do the next thing that you're supposed to do in jujitsu and i always like we've said this before of course but like in doing that you take some of that personal Mm. i'm in combat with someone away right as so instead of like oh he did this it's sort of like oh uh he's like it's like an opponent not a person do you know what right. i mean like it's i didn't i didn't trap his knee or i didn't i failed to keep my hand on his hip mm. or it's not like this guy just did something to me right you know what i mean like it's yeah. not this one-on-one and i think a lot of the stress comes from that when you're picturing the person i think it's i think it does it right. comes from the social implications and you're right. making it social now so it's oh is one of us losing status and one of us gaining status? What does this mean? Am I going to be able to survive and reproduce because <laughs> I'm losing status here? Where, you know, that's really ridiculous and has no real meaning in our right. life today. But we're still running those sort of programs in our unconscious. Yeah, yep. without a doubt. Um, oh, he had a, so one of the golfers that he was coaching. He said to the guy, "I don't care where the ball goes. I just." care about how it gets there so just like focus on your swing i guess your contact with the ball whatever the cues are so this guy did the same thing he didn't keep any score he just focused on his swing and um and then that, when he when he sank the final putt on the 18th hole at the end of the tournament his his uh guys who were playing with shook his hand he didn't think that that wasn't particularly meaningful but then all of a sudden his wife comes running onto the green screaming and he won, and he won like a one point six million dollar purse for winning the tournament. So, uh, pretty cool. So, um, yeah. So I, th- I just think there's so much value in that that idea of like focusing on your on your performance and your process. It's a little bit harder with jujitsu because it isn't as um, proactive. It's right. so much more reactive, you know. Um, but so the so the other thing. I got out of his book is so he has a process where he says there's three components of your mental management system. There's your conscious thought, your unconscious thought and your self image and conscious thought. It's just like what you're saying to yourself sort of before and during and after your unconscious is, you know, the techniques that you've internalized, basically your jujitsu technique or, or even maybe your own personal philosophy. It's just the way you see yourself and everything. And, the self-image actually is how you see yourself. It's more like your self-esteem. He calls it self-image. And when I read the book, I was like, oh, yeah, self-image, blah, blah, blah. Like it, it didn't really register with me, Dan, that it was something that was really important or that new or interesting. I had read um, a book called Psycho-Cybernetics many decades ago where the guy talks about self-image. I think it's Maxwell Maltz. Have you ever heard of that book? Yeah. So the guy was apparently, the story is, I take everything with a grain of salt. The story is he was a plastic surgeon in Manhattan and he would have patients come in and some would have like something like an unusual nose and they'd want their nose changed and he would change their nose and some of them would be very happy. And then some people would come in and there'd be nothing apparently unusual about their appearance, but they they would say, oh, my nose is hideous. And they had a perfectly regular normal nose. And then there were other people would come in, they'd have some problem and he would fix their problem and then they would say he didn't do anything. Like, it still wasn't fixed. Right. So he related all this to self-image. And his conclusion 
and you've heard this, I'm sure, some places, is that you can't outperform your self-image. Like it's a, it's a limiting factor. So if you and I go to jujitsu, and in your mind you say, well, I, I know I can't beat John. And in my, in my mind I say, well, I know I can beat Dan, then I'm going to beat you every time probably, right? Um, so when he was describing it on these YouTube videos, for some reason it just resonated and it became, just it made more sense to me and, and, and it seemed the idea had more value because, you know, he was saying, you try to get your technique better every day, but why wouldn't you have a system to improve your self-image a little bit every day? You know what I mean? It's almost like a mental hygiene or like a, a self-esteem hygiene. You, know, you brush your teeth. Why don't you have something to make sure that you're not limiting your performance by an insufficient self-image? What, what do you think about that, Dan? Um, yeah, I think we've touched on it before in, in here with in jujitsu. It's extremely relevant, right? I think it happens mm -hmm. in almost every role because you're in a gym where you know the other person. Mm -hmm. And you come into the role often with the thought of what you can or can't do against somebody. Right. And sort of slightly different is you can, during a role, you can, you know what I mean? You can be like, we've said this before, where you're like, you try to pass the guard three times mm -hmm. and then you're like, I can't do it. Right. I can't. And, and try to avoid that. You've said before to try to avoid that thought of like, I just can't. I can't get past this. Like, you know what I mean? They regain guard. You, they just, you fail three times and then you're just like, beaten and you right. just like drop down and then, then you definitely can't pass yeah, right. Right? Yeah. yeah yeah that's definitely the case yeah if you think you can't pass somebody's guard yeah you won't pass their guard yeah and i remember years ago before you were even i think delving into these strategies as deeply as you do now is like i remember that related to this was you your self-talk or your conscious thought where you would say to apply this example you'd say um you just be like, I can pass anybody's guard. Yeah. Things like that. You're like, yeah. I'm the best guard passer right. in the world. Or things yeah. like that, right? Like mm -hmm. to try to, and to me, that was trying to get past this, right? Like trying Definitely. To, yeah. Trying to not limit yourself. Trying to not limit yourself. Definitely. Because mm -hmm. we've said this before. We're also not stupid. Like I could say that a million times and still not pass your guard, but at least it's like, it's not a magic button, which is like now right. you can do whatever. Then you're it, just limited by your actual technique. Yeah. You're not limited by your self-belief. Right. It's like it's one, just clearing out that limitation. That one obstacle. Yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, if you think you don't, guess what? You're going to hesitate. You're not going to be as quick. And when you know that small window of opportunity opens up, you're going to hesitate because you go, wait a minute. I thought I couldn't pass this guard. Even though there's this small window of opportunity. I probably shouldn't invest the energy because I'm not going to make it anyways. Like right. it, it really does come back to that whole evolutionary psychology bit about we're always trying to do a cost benefit analysis. And if we don't think the benefit is real, if we don't think we can pass somebody's guard, it's unreasonable to spend energy to try to do it. Right. So if you raise your self image, you're actually raising the benefit side of the equation. So now you can work harder. You know what I mean? Right, and then ideally, the next step you're saying is like if you if you keep failing to pass the guard, if possible, instead of getting frustrated or thinking I can't do a thing, why? How did he? Stop, what technically? What happened yeah. to stop me? Like right. why did why did I fail? And if you don't know, you could ask them, right? Yeah. Like be like, or or ask someone else, or ask you, right? Like what? If if you can't pass someone guard, there's a technical reason, yes. right? Like you did something and they did something, and yes. you, you need every to time, that always, out, right? always. Yeah, and, and if a student can get in the habit of acting, asking that, what's the technical solution that I need here? If they can constantly do that, they're just going to get better and better. You know, so that leads us to some questions that Lanny Basham came up with that seem very simple, Dan, but I think they're powerful. So what I've been doing is after my training, I ask myself these questions and I write in a little journal answers to the question. But you could also use these for any activity, jujitsu, anything. And um, you could use these questions to ask your children after they come back from a baseball game or some event, anything that they do. So instead of, you know, think about it this way. If your kid went and had a basketball game and came home, your natural question would be, Did you win? You could say, did you win? Yeah. Or, how, or how did it go? Yeah. And um, even did if you, something yeah. as innocuous as how did it go, that leaves the door open for everything. Right. Uh, how to go? Terrible. I I sucked. I I lost the ball at the critical moment right. of the game, and I lost the game. Or it could be good, but 
everything's on the table, good and bad. Right. So he suggests the first question you should ask is, what did you do well? Hmm. That's it. So you're you're looking for a way to enhance the self-image, like right off the jump. You know what I mean? It could be like, well, I scored the game-winning basket, or it could be um, I didn't lose the ball this game. I've been giving up turnovers every other game. This time I had no turnovers. You know, they can right. find something to build on and, and to increase their self-image. And, um, and I noticed that in my training now, so I come back from training. What did I do well? One day I had like 10 things that I did well. And man, I felt great after yeah. writing all 10 <laughs> things down. And going through the process of writing, handwriting it down, I had to think about it and write it down. I just think there's something in that process that can add to your self-image. Um, I think it's very effective. Uh, and the, so here's another thing. Wait, but before you go on, yeah. the one thing that's important there is, because I, I, I lean this way and I'm sure a lot of other people yep. do, that can also prevent you from just like being super negative yeah. all the time. Because yeah. I've said that where you can just focus on, you could have 10 rolls in the gym and one you got to, you did badly and you yep. could leave like today sucked. Yeah, right? like in, I got guillotined by this so-and-so. Who usually and doesn't tap me. And I don't know I, what the tap. hell's wrong with me. Blah, and blah, you blah. forget the other nine rolls. You know, right. like I do that all the time. Or even just working out, I'll be like, why was my bench press so weak today? It was mm. terrible. And, I, you know, you forget the rest of the workout. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and if you ask that question, then at least it makes you remember that it wasn't all. Bad. Here's a, here's another thing it can do, Dan. It can focus you on the positive instead of the negative. Yeah. So here's how from these questions I started to do something different in my training. So one day I was training with my son, preparing for this last sub only match, and he's he's standing up. He's trying to pass my guard. He's and Rory's great at guard passing, and I'm defending and defending and defending. And it's going on for a long time. He's got me in a cycle of defense where he's just coming and I'm just trying to fend him off. I'm getting tired. I'm getting discouraged. And I sort of turned to get up like the turtle. And then he jumps on my back. Now he's trying to strangle me from back control and I'm fighting out. And then I get out of back control. And I said, I can't do that. I can't just turtle like that. I got to get my guard back. I got to attack from my guard or keep defending my guard. But I just can't give my back like that anymore. He's like, yeah, especially in a sub only. That doesn't make yeah. any sense. If they pass your guard, that doesn't really help them. There's no scoring going on. I was, uh, so then what I did, though, Dan, I didn't leave there saying, I got to stop turtling. I got to stop turtling. I envisioned in my mind doing the proper thing like 10 times in a row where like, yeah. oh, I got my guard back. I got my guard back. I got my guard back. And I did it like 10 times. So then when I left, I think two things happened. Not only did I ingrain the right behaviors more strongly into my nervous system, I felt better about myself because it's like I actually didn't make a mistake. I did the right thing 10 times. So it, it's a double benefit. and right. proved my self-image a little bit and, and, and actually ingrained doing the right behavior even more strongly than just going, God damn it, I got to stop doing that. Yeah. Like that, I got to stop doing that. I don't think that helps you that much. I think it lowers your self-image a little bit. It doesn't really ingrain the solution into you enough. Does that make sense? Totally. Because I, again... I'm pretty good about doing the wrong thing in jiu-jitsu all the time. So I used to do that all the time. We're like, I got to stop. I got to stop. And I wouldn't put in my head what I should do. Sometimes yeah. I honestly wouldn't even know what I should do. I just I be like, people... I got to stop giving up my back. Right? And then like, but I wouldn't even think clearly about what I should do instead. I think people do it for everything. Like, I got to lose some weight. Man, I got to lose right. some weight. And that doesn't really help you, I don't think. Right? Yeah. This makes Instead you feel like, like a slob. I should, I've got to do this. I've I'm going to start I've got to run three times this. a week. Yeah. I've got I to eat better. Bro. Yeah. I'm not I'm not drinking soda. Right. I'm right. done with soda. Like a solution, like leaning into a solution. Right. I like how he said, what did you do well? I think the like sometimes he says, what did you do right? But I don't like the word right because it's very binary, right? You either did something mm -hmm. right or you did it wrong. Did something well. You could not have, you, you could do something better than before. Still not to get the result you want, but you did it well because you're improving, right? So, yeah, I just like that that phrase, what did you do well? So then the second question you ask your kid or yourself or whatever is what did you learn? And that's, you know, right. we kind of all get that, but that's good. And then the third question you ask, which I really like, is and uh, what are you going to do about it? So I really like that because it brings everything back around to behavior and activity, you know? Right. 
It's not like the secret where we're going to envision a big mansion I'm going to live in. I'm going to cut out pictures and put it on a board and stare at it all day long. I don't know. Maybe that'll help you. But if you don't go out and do something, you know, your it's dreams can't It's sort of the point we true. were just making, right? Like mm-hmm. it, instead of saying, I need to lose weight, like what are you going to do? Yeah. What right? are you going to do? Yeah. Or like, I, I can't believe I got tapped. It's like, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? I couldn't get it. What did you learn? Um, I have to improve my mount escapes because I was stuck in the bottom of the mount for 20 minutes. So what are you going to do? I'm going to train it every day. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I mean, it's it's a pretty simple but infallible program just to make improvement, right? Yeah. And to develop yourself. So um, I'm, I'm still working on some other things. So he has this other thing where he says, you know, there's an optimal thing to say to yourself before, during, and after your activity, you know. So I guess what they do is before they shoot, they're thinking or saying something to yourself, I guess it's the same thing as thinking. Then as they're shooting, they're saying something. And then afterwards, they're saying something. And uh, I guess he has it op- He has got it all figured out probably for shooting. But I don't know exactly how to apply that to jiu-jitsu yet or the other parts of life. But I can picture it in jiu-jitsu if there's something specific you're working on. You could tell yourself going into a role like oh, right. make sure you... Keep your elbows in, in or whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever it is that you're working on that day. Protect your neck. I yeah, I do not know what they say. I imagine they say something like, shoot the gun. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to shoot the gun. I'm shooting the gun. And I shot the gun. I don't know what else <laughs> they be it. I don't know what else. I guess they have like breathing. Make sure you. Uh, I think the heart sure rate is breathe. important. Breathing keep your heart, is probably important. Keep your heart rate down yeah. or whatever it is. Now, so that's only some of the stuff he had to offer. He had one other thing that sounds a little hokey, Dan, but I think you'll agree it's it's pretty cool. I don't think he came up with this. I've heard this in a couple of other places, but he really does a good job of explaining the sentiment and making it practical and useful. He said, "Think, don't think that the universe is doing something to you. Think that the universe is doing something for you. And when he brings this in, this concept into competition, he says, whatever happens at the competition, uh, it's meant to happen, and it's for your benefit. So if you're looking at it that way, you can find benefit in any result that you get. So he gives a couple stories, so you'll get a kick out of this. So he's like this. When he was a little kid, he said he was short, slow, weak, like not a good athlete. Um, and one day, I think he was in the fifth or sixth grade, the teacher was talking about the Olympics and different people, and the teacher says, who knows, maybe one day somebody in this very classroom will win a gold medal in the Olympics. Kids, who do you think is most likely to win a gold medal in the Olympics? And this little shit sitting next to Lenny Basham throws his hand up, and the teacher calls on the kid. The kid goes, I don't know who's most likely, but I know who's <laughs> most not likely to win. It's definitely Lenny. He's never going to win a gold medal. Can you imagine so can say that? that little shit. Yeah, I yeah. could imagine it. So he said he was so bummed out, and, and he goes, and it basically was true, which has yeah. made it even worse. So he came home, and he was totally bummed out, and depressed, and told his parents about it. And it sounds like he had great parents. And his, and his dad, dad was in the military, and his dad said something that effective. You know what, Lanny? You're great at something. You just haven't figured out what it is yet. So, you know, just we'll just take the time and we'll figure it out. Yeah, that little shit determined the rest of his entire life for this guy. <laughs> so then he started reading books about Olympic athletes. And then, uh, so you read all these stories about people that become gold medalists, but they have some sort of like, uh, I don't know if handicap is the right word, before they find their 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 footing and their genius, you know? Right. And so he ended up stumbling upon the shooting stuff out of like a search to find something. So if that little shit hadn't embarrassed him yeah. in class that day, he would never have found the shooting. And he actually did get a gold medal in the Olympics, which is crazy, right? right. So this kid yeah. said, he's the last one. And he's the only yeah, one, yeah. of course, probably yeah. in the history of the whole school that ever got a gold medal in the Olympics right. and a world championship in, in the Olympics. So, um, that horrible moment was, was to actually, see to like yeah. all the benefit he's, he's gotten yeah. in his life. I almost prefer, so this point was the universe is doing something for you. Yeah. I, to, yeah. To me, it's a little hokey because you're it's like, hokey. You know, 
but I I would change it a little for me anyway yeah. to more like some version of like it it the universe could be doing something for you. Do you know okay. what I mean? Like depending on like that that bad moment, maybe that was not something for you, but it could be. Do you know what I mean? Like I could or see any that. experience could be, and you could make it that with how with your own yeah. actions. Do you know what I mean? Like because not every thing that happens is for you and is beneficial in the long run. And but I think it's a good mindset to go in my, that my, it could my, be. My pushback to you, Dan, would be if you go into it with the idea that it is is doing something for you, then that's going to then you find it. Is that yeah, saying? requires right. you to right. find it. Now it's your job to find it. If it could be, you're like, eh. Nothing maybe, jumping maybe, out at maybe me. This Nothing just, jumping out at me. Screw yeah, it. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really, yeah. If I'm looking for it, I don't think I've seen anything in a while. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Go find it. Yeah. So I, I think it's – and I found – so going into my last competition, I was feeling – I was thinking about this. And, you know, of course I want to win and I want to do well. But it's comforting to say, well, whatever happens, it's going to be for my benefit anyways. And it's not that impractical because – yeah, if you get arm barred, you're like, well, obviously I get, I have to get better at defending arm bars, and it, and it'll give you your sort of your curriculum for the next six months or whatever, give you yeah. something to work on. Like that's the very least that it can do, and that it's comforting to have that notion going into a high pressure situation. Like whatever happens, it's going to be for my benefit anyways. So um, I think it's very interesting, you know. And I was thinking about. Not to get too personal in my life here, but you know, I went through a breakup in the beginning of 2018, and sort of because of that, I ended up talking to my son and say, "Hey, maybe I should go compete." And I can guarantee you, if that breakup didn't happen, I would never have competed again in jujitsu. So then I ended up getting so much benefit from that, you know, so many amazing experiences, and you know, I've grown as a coach and as a competitor my jiu-jitsu is way better than it was then and um I'm, i think i'm a better coach i have a better yeah i have a better relationship with my son we're even you know even right. closer and deeper uh as as colleagues and friends and everything so you didn't see that at all at the time right i mean you didn't, didn't see, see it at all yeah. yeah but and it's and i'm not rationalizing anything yeah. you know what i mean it's real huge benefits you know i have like I think I have like 10 or 11 now, like sort of like pretty big tournament wins uh, and medals up on my wall now that I would never have had and great experiences too that I wouldn't yeah. have had. And um, my life would have been way less interesting and fulfilling without those experiences, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the universe is doing something. I know you come here and you think sometimes we're, this podcast is doing something to you, Dan, <laughs> not, for, not for you. Yeah, that one I'm not having shake, <laughs> shaken off yet, but there's uh, some good will come out of this. Yeah, yeah I've got to find it. I better find it. You've got to find but it. But we also learned that we are over trying. I need right. To, I need to try a little less. We got to focus on our on the process or yeah. yeah, our performance. Right. Don't worry about the results. <laughs> Which is true. Like if if we sweat, how many people listen to us and watch us? It's probably not the right way yeah. to, to to arrange our podcast. You know, I think this is a great podcast. Some great information for people, right? And um, Lanny Basham, B-A-S-S-H-A-M. Definitely check him out on YouTube. That's the easiest thing to do. You don't even have to read a book. Watch some of his videos. Just great stuff. Seems like a great guy. And um, I think that's all we got, Dan, right? Sounds good. Yeah. All right, folks. Please subscribe. Tell your friends about this. Share it. And we'll talk to you next week. Take care.